Assalamu alaikum. Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to this uh, special webinar by the Egyptian Society of the FRCR. Today, we have a special guest. Um, it's a Dr. Zaba Jawa. Uh, Dr. Jawa is a consultant in nuclear medicine in uh, Sultan Kamus uh, University Hospital, and uh, he holds uh, the European uh, Board uh, Certified in uh, Nuclear Medicine and Fellowship of the College of Radiologists of uh, Nigeria. Dr. Jawa works as uh, assistant professor in the University of the Jazeera. Uh, the lecture today will be entitled uh, Overview of the Nuclear Medicine and uh, Bone Centigraphy. Uh, welcome, Dr. Jawa, and uh, um, I'll let you uh, get it from here. You have the mic. Yeah, thank, thank you, Dr. Thank you very much, Sharif. Uh, it's a pleasure to be part of this um, exercise, and I'm really honored to be invited to give this talk. Um, today, my, the title of my presentation will be an overview of nuclear medicine, and then I will then take some time to discuss bone scintigraphy. So I'm like more of giving two presentations at a time, but I think that it's important to give an overview so that my audience and uh, particularly registrars will understand the very basic principle of nuclear medicine. So the what I aim to achieve today with this presentation and the main objective is to provide you with the very basic principles of nuclear medicine imaging and therapy. And then I will specifically talk about bone scan. I would like to make you understand the principle of bone scan imaging, how to identify a bone scan, how to interpret the very basic pathologies that we uh, are able to see on bone scan and how to give recommendation of bone scan, or if you interpret a bone scan, if there are other equivocal lesions that you are not clear about, what other recommendations can you make? I will pay emphasis on the strength and the weaknesses of bone scan, but particularly I will be talking about sensitivity and specificity, because we know one of the biggest strengths of a nuclear medicine bone scan is its high sensitivity, but unfortunately it suffers from a low uh, specificity, which I will discuss in my, in, my pitch, in my paper. Now again, I would also like to have you, as, as part of my achievement, I will also want you to have confidence in interpreting bone scan any time you see a bone scan, and that you should not panic, uh, particularly in exams when you see bone scan. It's a very simple, it's very easy. Once you follow the methodology and you are consistent with your methodology, uh, you realize that bone scintigraphy is probably one of the most simple imaging modality to interpret. Now, the, the, in the beginning, let's just, just go back. I'm really going to talk very basic. I'm not undermining the knowledge of my audience, but just to be very basic so that we can understand I'm taking from the beginning. You might want to ask what a nuclear medicine is. It's just a medical specialty that you, utilizes nuclear agents for diagnosis and therapy. So in nuclear medicine, we do both diagnosis and we do therapy. So depending on which department you work in the world, some departments do predominantly diagnosis, but others do therapy. So it's both the diagnosis and therapy, but indeed what we use is a nuclear material. And that's why we are also referred to as nuclear uh, medicine. Now, to understand the very basic principle of nuclear medicine scan, I have to take you back to the very basic physics. We remember from our elementary physics that an atom is the smallest indivisible particle of an element. And within the atom, there is a nucleus. And if you recall, the nucleus has a positively charged proton and a neutral neutron. This is what composes of the nucleus. Whereas the shell, just like the egg, is composed of an, a negative uh, electron. So this is a basic structure of an atom. Now, atoms in nature uh, are divided into two. You have atoms that are stable and atoms that are unstable. Now, a stable atom is that that has the same number of proton and electron, meaning that the positive charge and the negative charge are equal. Now, that atom is stable. But in an atom that is unstable, that is the atom that we use. It is unstable because it has either an excess of proton or a proton deficient, or it has an excess of neutron. And I would want to use this model. I usually like to use this model as an example. So if you look at this atom that is considered to be unstable, in this circumstance, it has excess of proton. So what this atom will really do is that it tries to eject the excess proton that it has from the nucleus of this atom. And on the process, it collides with an electron that is in the outer shell of the atom. So what happens is that when you have a positive and a negative colliding, what you have is an avalanche of radiation. This radiation is referred to as the gamma rays, 
and on, that is why we use the term gamma camera. So essentially what we are imaging is the gamma rays that comes out from the nucleus of an unstable atom. Again, that is why we are called nuclear because majority of the radiation that we utilize for our diagnosis and our therapy emanates from the nucleus of an unstable atom. And that's why also our equipment, the two basic equipments that we have in nuclear medicine, the SPECT and the PET. The SPECT is a single photon emission computer tomography. These days it is combined with a SPECT, uh, with a CT, as well as the positron emission computer tomography. Both of these equipments are referred to as a gamma camera. The basic principle of imaging modality and the basic principle of image acquisition is the same. What differs is essentially the type of radio pharmaceutical and the information that you get from this equipment. One thing I also like to remind my audience at this point is that this equipment does not emit any radiation. Unlike your MRI, your CT, and other diagnostic modality, this equipment does not release any radiation. Instead, it detects the radiation that comes out from the patient. Essentially, what we do in nuclear medicine is to inject the patient or the patient ingests radioactive atom. The patient becomes a source of radiation and the patient is lied under this camera and the camera, the, the rays are emitted from different angles of the patient and this camera detects the images and makes the, um, and then makes the image. The same thing happens with both the SPECT as well as the PET imaging, which I'll discuss with you subsequently. But today we are going to pay more emphasis on bone scan are essentially done with the single photon emission computer tomography, sometimes with a CT for better anatomical localization and attenuation correction. So these are the um, list of the radio, unstable radioactive atoms that I basically use in nuclear medicine. And today we will look at technetium. Technetium has a half-life of six hours, so it takes six hours to decay. And on the process of decay, it emits a gamma radiation of 140 keV. 140 keV is the ideal energy window that is essential for our spec machine and therefore the image quality that you get from technetium is the best. It has a short half-life, six hours, enough for you to image your patient and optimal energy enough for you to make a diagnosis and not high energy enough to cause cell damage or cell death. Uh, there are other uh, nuclear materials that I use. Another example you can see is iodine-131 which has a rich longer half-life of eight days and a lot of en other en beta energies. This can be used both for diagnosis and for therapy. But essentially this table shows you the basic radioactive and stable atoms that we use in nuclear medicine for our imaging. These are essentially for, for imaging. Now, if you, again, the basic principle of technetium, which is the house um, hold of nuclear medicine radioactive atom, Technetium 99M, which is the metastable, is pure gamma emitter. So very suitable for image. The energy is suitable for a gamma camera. Like I told you, it's energy of 140 keV. It has an optimal half-life of six hours, which is, is sufficient enough for imaging. And it is very available. It is available from something called the molybdenum technetium generator. The molybdenum is essentially the mother of technetium. So molybdenum decays every 24 hours and it gives you technetium and technetium 99M decays to stable technetium. So in the process of the molybdenum and technetium decay, you have the emission of this gamma rays, which is used for the patient. So, but just remember that we do not just inject the patient with the radioactive atom alone. If you inject technetium into the body, it goes to various parts of the tissue of the body. So for us to be able to localize the tissue of interest or the cancer of interest or the body area of interest, we need to understand the concept of radio pharmaceutical, which is also the tracer. So the radio pharmaceutical is a combination basically of the radioactive atom and the pharmaceutical substance. Now the pharmaceutical is a suitable substance or a suitable chemical substance that is localized um, in a tissue of the body. So for instance, if you have this as your radioactive atom, and today we are talking about technetium 99M for bone scan, what we have is the radioactive material is technetium 99M, and the pharmaceutical agent for imaging bone scan is MDP, MDT, MDP, and MDP is methylene diphosphonate. So what we do is we have a laboratory within our department called the hot lab where the radioactive atom and the radio pharmaceutical is tagged. So you now have the tagging of this two, and this is what is referred to as the radio pharmaceutical. And it's usually uh, labeled in a bottle form, and it is usually essentially what we use every day to tag for each of the patient that we inject for a bone scan or other 
imaging modalities. Now, this is the basic imaging modality of radi technetium-based radio pharmaceuticals that are used in nuclear medicine. But remember again at this point that there are other radioactive atoms or other organs in the body that do not need a pharmaceutical because they are localized by that um, organ. The major example is the thyroid. The thyroid does not need a pharmaceutical. Once you inject technetium, technetium is handled about the same way the thyroid handles iodine. So if you want to do a thyroid scintigraphy, you don't, need to, you don't need to tag technetium to any compound because technetium in itself, it is localized by the thyroid as, um, as, as iodine. Now MDP, like I said, methylene diphosphonate, which is used for bone scan, is a suitable radio pharmaceutical. And we tag radio pharmaceutical technetium 99, MDP. And what we do is we do a skeletal image. If you want to image the kidneys, you use DTPA. If you want to image the liver or the other organs like myocardium, you use MIBG, um, MIB, and colloid for liver and spleen. So all the various organs in the body and tissues in the body have suitable pharmaceutical agents. And all we need to do in our laboratory or in our department is to tag this suitable radiopharmaceutical to technetium-99. So purely what this pharmaceutical does is to help transport this technetium into the organ of interest. Today we are going to be looking at how technetium or MDP carries technetium into the skeletal system and that permits us to image the, essentially the musculoskeletal system. So if you look at, these are other radio pharmaceuticals, like I mentioned earlier, that do not need tagging. One of them is gallium-67. This has been used previously, no longer used again. It's been used for tumor and infection image. Indium iodine-131. We have a radioactive iodine-131. Again, this is an active substance that does not need, because it's a radioactive iodine, you don't need to tag it. So all this radio pharmaceutical in this table, you don't need to do the normal tagging process. They, on their own, are referred to or they can serve as pharmaceuticals. Now, so this um, table shows you ex essentially what we do. So for each organ system in the body, like I said, we tag technetium to the suitable chemical substance. If we want to image the brain, we tag technetium, which helps MPAO, and what we get is a functional distribution of the images of the brain. If we want to look at lung function, we do MAA, we tag technetium to MAA, and we get a distribution of function of the lungs. And for various organs of the body, and look at our musculoskeletal system that we are going to discuss today. We inject technetium with a DTPA, with a MDP to get a distribution of function of the skeleton. So again, this table just gives you a pictorial presentation of what we do in terms of nuclear medicine acquisition in, our, in most nuclear medicine department. So this injection is what we give to our patients. So we inject the patient. In this circumstance, we inject the patient with technetium labeled with MDP. And then the patient becomes a source of radiation. So radiation comes out from the patient and our scintigraphic camera, in this case, our SPECT camera, will then detect the images and there are numerous processes that happens before this image uh, is then displayed as an anterior and posterior projection. So this is purely and basically what the imaging modality or the basic imaging principle of nuclear medicine entails. Now, the, what is the advantage of nuclear medicine over other imaging modalities? Now, because we are administering radio pharmaceutical, this radio pharmaceutical has to be injected into the vascular compartment or sometimes ingested by the patient or installed depending on the type of examination you want to do. But today we are talking about bone scan. So we are injecting technetium 99 MD, MDP. It has to be carried by blood flow. So you have to have a up blood flow to that region. You have to have a viable tissue. In this circumstance, you have to have a viable osteoblastic tissue that will take, this, that will take the radio pharmaceutical. So that means that whatever we are doing is physiologic. So nuclear medicine images are physiological image. They depict function. They depict metabolism. Now we are given a tracer dose. And a tracer dose, by definition, is a dose that does not alter function. Again, that emphasizes that we are doing physiology. So our images are functional because we inject with a tracer dose. And they are completely uninvasive. Nuclear medicine techniques are not invasive like other techniques where you need to cannulate. The only time we become inv invasive is when we cannulate the, cannulate the patient and inject the patient. And believe you me, the radiation that is used in nuclear medicine is, is relatively low compared to other diagnostic modalities that you do. Now, in terms of therapy, we do specific target therapy. Today, we are not going to be discussing therapy, so I'm not going to be 
going into the detail of what we do for therapy, but these are the advantages of nuclear medicine. So the point I want you to carry home on this slide is that always remember that nuclear medicine images are not anatomical images. They are not morphological images. They depict function and they depict function because they rely on blood flow and viable tissue for them to be taken off. So, and we know that the advantages, this advantage is that if you do an if you are relying on physiological information, that means you will detect disease much more earlier um, in the process of the disease before anatomical changes occur. Um, so, but again, because of this, we have limitations. And I always love, this is one of my best slides because it is good to know your strength and it is good to know your weaknesses. Now, one of the major limitations of nuclear medicine images is that we do not have anatomical detail because all we are looking at is we are looking at blood flow, we are looking at tissue function. So sometimes we struggle, particularly in smaller areas in the vertebrae, I will show you in my subsequent slides, and areas in the brain and smaller tissues, and sometimes we struggle. So we are not anatomical, but the good news is that we are able to overcome this limitation because most of our spec machine are also hybrid. So they means that they have a CT component. And the idea of installing a CT to a gamma camera is for anatomical localization and for attenuation correction. The CTs are not diagnostic. They only provide us with localization of tissues or localization of pathology. And same happens in PET imaging. Um, because they lack anatomical imaging, they lack anatomical details, we need, a, we need a CT component for it, again, for anatomical localization uh, and attenuation correction. Now, in certain disease condition, particularly that we are talking about bone scan today, one of the limitations of nuclear medicine scan is that we are not specific, very specific, but we are extremely sensitive. So at this point, let me again become very elementary. Sensitivity is the ability to detect disease. So if the disease is there, we will be able to detect it. But the issue is that our specificity is low. We will not be able to say what this is because anything, for instance, in bone scan, any factor that increases blood flow, that increases vascularity, uh, increase blood flow or increase osteoblastic or bone turn off will show as an increase uptake. An increase that can be seen in trauma, in arthritis, in infection. So, but again, the very good news about this is that we are able to overcome this because we can always combine our images with clinical history. We can combine it with other diagnostic tests. We can recognize pattern, even though we are non, very, very non-specific. There are certain disease conditions that have pattern of distribution that are specific for that disease. So at this point, I would also like to let you know that whenever we are interpreting a bone scan, we are, the idea of doing an interpretation of the bone scan is basically to increase your specificity. If you are looking at a bone scan without any history, without any uh, information, your bone scan at that point is sensitive. It's probably about 190 to 100% sensitive, depending on how it is done. But it lacks specificity. Now, if you improve any point that you are improving, you are looking at the clinical history, you are looking at the pattern of the uptake and the abnormality, you are combining it with other diagnostic tests, you are combining it with a CT, with each of this point, you are raising your specificity so that at the end of the day, when you are putting up your bone scan report, your report should be 100% sensitive and close to 100% specific, depending on your expertise and your experiences. So the idea of reporting a nuclear medicine bone scan, like I always say, is struggling to increase your specificity, which I will discuss with you subsequently. So now going to bone scan, um, bone scan is also referred to as bone scintigraphy. It is also called bone scan or it's sometimes referred to as skeletal scintigraphy. So each of these names that you use uh, is, is, is suffices, but oftentimes people refer to it as bone scan, but this can be a misnomer because bone scan can be DEXA scan, can be anything. But once you say it's a bone scintigraphy or a skeletal scintigraphy, that tells you that you are using the scintigraphic. The scintigraphic machine is basically the gamma camera machine. So bone scintigraphy is probably the most ideal um, nomenclature for describing um, imaging bone, scan, bone um, in nuclear medicine. So what are the, like, the basic information that you get from bone scan is it helps you to evaluate the skeletal physiology. Again, we are not anatomical. What we are looking at is we're looking at physiology, we are looking at, um, we are looking at metabolism. So we are relying, of course, we are looking at blood flow, 
we are looking at osteoblastic function. Now, the a nuclear a bone scan is the most common nuclear medicine examination. In fact, most nuclear medicine department in the world, the most common nuclear medicine examination is a bone scan, and the most common indication is the indication for detection of skeletal metastasis in patients with known primary malignancies. So almost all the patients that will come to nuclear medicine scan for bone scan will come in order for us to detect a metastasis. And these patients will usually, oftentimes, will come with a diagnosis, either a breast CA, a prostate CA, and looking for metastasis. Now, bone scan has the advantage that it is cheap, it is easy to perform, and we are doing a whole body. Uh, so with a single injection, you are, in, you, are you are acquiring images in the anterior and posterior projection, which I'll show you later. And these are the four groups or the four views or, um, that you are able to acquire with, um, body, with bone scans. You can do a whole body bone scan. You can have a static view. You can have a tomographic view. You can have a spec or a spec CT view. And there's a technique also referred to as a three-phase bone scan. The three-phase bone scan is you are looking at vascular, you are looking at tissue and you are looking at bone phase. I'm going to show you um, in my sense, in my subsequent slides, um, how these various modalities and various acquisitions look on a bone scan. But again, remember, bone scan is extremely sensitive because whatever alters blood flow and alters osteoblastic function will show as an abnormal otic. Unfortunately, low specificity. So low specificity means you will see an optic that optic may be metastasis, may be similar to infection, may be due to trauma, may be due to metabolic disease, may be due to benign lesion. So today I'm going to take so much time to give you the various pattern that you will be able to just looking at a bone scan, be able to differentiate that this is metastasis, this is how infection looks, this is how trauma looks, this is how metabolic bone disease looks, and this is how benign bone lesion looks. Uh, so this is really going to be the mainstay and the main emphasis of my um, presentation and the slides that I'm going to show you um, subsequently. So what are the other um, indications for a bone scan? Bone scan, like we said, the most important indication is the detection and follow-up of bone metastasis in patients with known primary malignancy. Now it can, we can also use bone scan to evaluate fractures that are not seen on x-rays. These days this is taken over by MRI, but if MRI is not available, bone scan is a very unique technique that you can use to um, diagnose fractures, especially stress fractures. I show you one or two images of stress fractures. You can use it to investigate the cause of an unexplained bone pain or back pain. Uh, you can use bone scan to evaluate lesions that are seen on x-ray that you want to characterize these lesions or you want to see the extent of this lesion. Bone scan has extensively been used in differentiating osteomyelitis from cellulitis. This is very key, particularly in children. You want to differentiate osteomyelitis from cellulitis because the therapy or the treatment modality is different. Osteomyelitis will require some sort of surgical intervention, whereas uh, cellulitis will require probably just antibiotic therapy. We can use bone scan to evaluate patients with avascular necrosis, particularly sickle cell patients with avascular necrosis of the head of femur. Bone scan has been used um, previously for investigation possible child abuse. Um, we have gone to court on several occasions previously just using a bone scan in patients or in children that have been abused because it's a whole body image. It gives you the area of fracture or area of trauma that this patient sustains. Um, you can use bone scan to determine the cause of pain in patients with joint prosthesis. You can use bone scan to follow up patients with Paget's disease. And you can also use bone scan as an indication for reflex sympathetic dystrophy and for to gauge the heterotrophic um, calcification of tissue. So these are among some of the clinical indication of day-to-day -day that we received for bone scintigraphy. And I will try as much as possible in the course of this presentation to show you at least all of these um, images, and then you'll be able to differentiate those pathology on a bone scan. Now, the, again, like I said, the indication of a bone scan is primarily to look for metastasis. Remember that not all metastases spread into the skeleton, but the common metastasis that we see that uh, metastasize to the skeleton is breast cancer, prostate cancer, lung, renal, and thyroid cancers. But it's also important at this point to note that even those malignancies that metastasize to the skeleton, they have a preferential area in the skeleton that they go. And they have, a, uh, in, they have a pattern, like we have osteoblastic and osteolytic. So breast cancer, for instance, is mainly mixed osteoblastic, osteolytic, and it has preferential to the, to the ax, uh, ax, axial skeleton. 
prostate cancer is usually purely osteoblastic. It has preference for the entire skeleton, but usually preference for the axial skeleton. Non-cancer in the other way is one of the cancers that has preferential metastasis to the appendicular skeleton. Now, renal cancer and thyroid cancers are the two cancers that have pure osteolytic lesions and sometimes can be very notorious and difficult for us to diagnose on bone scan. It is easy to see osteoblastic activity on a bone scan than osteolytic activity. Again, I'll show you some few images that will display um, the skins that I've described. So what we're looking at is we're looking at osteoblastic activity and osteoblastic activity, any area that shows an increase osteoblastic, osteoblastic activity will show as an increased uptake. And this is the term that is used as a hot spot. So each time you see a hot spot on a bone scan or we refer to a hot spot on a bone scan means that that area has an increased osteoblastic activity and it has a hot area. The area can be dark depending on the color preference you use, but oftentimes bone scans are displayed as white and black color. So it will be a black dot. Now areas that are osteolytic means that there is absence of either blood flow or there is absence of viable tissue. So this area will show as an absent optic. And because there is no optic, that area appears cold. And that's why we use cold spots. So you can remember from your preliminary um, uh, textbooks, you will see the term used as hot spots and cold spot. And sometimes we use this term such as warm spot, where you will see that the uptake is not as high as an osteoblastic one, and there is not complete absence, but there is some evidence of uptake, and this is called a reduced uptake, and this is what we see sometimes, and we refer to as a warm uptake. And sometimes this happens in cold lesions. There are certain cold lesions that eventually will become hot lesions. So sometimes we, you will see the term um, as warm lesions. So anytime you see an increased uptake, and a bone scan means that there is increased osteoblastic activity. This may be as a result of increased blood flow or increased bone turnover. If you hear us talk about cold areas, means that that area is deprived of blood flow or it is deprived of osteoblastic activity or both. Um, so this are the this um, slide shows you the scintigraphic pattern in metastasis. So metastasis, depending on the primary disease. Again, depending on whether it is a hot spot or it's a cold spot, can be solitary. So you can have just one single lesion, either in the skull or in the vertebrae or in the appendicular skeleton. So these are the various presentation. Or you can have multiple focal. So you can have multifocal disease. You can have widespread metastasis, either preferentially involving the axial skeleton, like we see in breast cancers, or preferentially involving the appendicular skeleton, like in lung cancers or involving both appendicular and axial skeleton. So it's multifocal. Then you can have a diffuse uptake. A diffuse uptake means that the entire skeleton is infiltrated by malignancy. So you will not see a focal lesion. All you will see is diffuse uniform uptake. And that, unfortunately, that kind of scan looks very beautiful. And sometimes it is called a beautiful bone scan. And it's also referred to as a super scan. I will tell you and show you in subsequent slides how a uh, super scan look and super scan can be found in not only in malignancy but super scan can also appear in metabolic bone disease like um, para hyperparathyroidism or renal osteodystrophy you can get super scan from metastasis particularly metastasis from prostate cancer now again like we say you can have a photon deficient area or a cold lesion one this cold lesion can be a single cold lesion or it can be a multiple cold lesion again remember the two malignancies that metastasize to the skeleton that gives you pure osteolytic regions, uh, thyroid CA and renal CA. Um, so, and then you can have a distribution which is false negative. This is almost close to the diffuse um, involvement that you have in the entire skeleton. This is a type of a presentation where the bone scan looks absolutely normal. It is not a super scan like I, show, I will show you subsequently, but it's false. It is false because, or it's normal, because the, the entire skeleton is infiltrated by micro metastasis. So the uptake will be uniform and you wouldn't be able to see um, a particular or a pathological uptake. Now there is also a phenomenon called the flare phenomenon. And this happens when a patient undergoes, a patient with a non-metastasis 
undergoes therapy and there's flaring of metastasis where you will see an increase in number, an increase in size of this metastatic lesion. This is not showing progression of disease, but instead it is telling you that the disease is flaring because of therapy. Again, I'm showing you um, those images in my subsequent slides. So these are the six presentation of metastasis in the skeleton on a bone scan. Focal lesion, multiple lesion, super scan, cold lesion, a false negative, and of course, a flare phenomenon. Now, the acquisition of a whole body bone, body, uh, um, a bone scan, like I said, can be whole view. So it means that you are imaging the patient from head to toe in anterior and posterior projection. You can have static images. I will show you what static images is. You can have a 3D rotating image, spect image, and three-phase bone scan image. So I'll subsequently show you how um, those scans look. So this is a beautiful normal bone scan. So a, a normal bone scan is projected as a whole body. So it's from head to toe, and it is projected in anterior and posterior projection. So the advantage of bone scan is that you have an anterior and posterior projection of the patient in one glance. So at a glance, you are looking at the entire patient. So apart from detecting for metastasis or the disease process that you're looking for, the advantage of a whole body bone scan is that it permits you to also look for incidental findings. You will be able to see other disease that are totally unrelated to the clinical history of the patient. This also gives you the advantage of localizing and looking at the functions of the kidney. So how do you identify bone scan? Remember, bone scan appearance changes with age. The bone scan appearance of a pediatric patient is different from the bone scan appearance in adult patient. And our next slides will show you that of pediatric. But this is an adult patient. The pediatric patient, usually you will see uptake in the growth plate because the growth plate has increased osteoblastic activity. I'll show you subsequently. So this is a whole body bone scan. This is anterior view on the right and left. Most imaging will show you right and left and this is posterior imaging. It is important to understand how to interpret a bone scan. The first thing is to quickly do a QC. A QC means that you want to be able to see if this image is reportable and if it's indeed a true whole body. So a true whole body means that the entire of the skeleton is within the field of view of um, the image in anterior and posterior projection. You also want to be sure that this patient is not rotated, the patient is symmetrical. You want to be sure that the acquisition, because remember we are not exposing, unlike x-rays where you say you expose the patient, in nuclear medicine the, we are acquiring. So you're acquiring statistical information, you're acquiring statistical counts from the camera. So a very perfect image is the one that you can see the intervertebral disc space. So once you can see an intervertebral disc space, it means that the count is sufficient in a bone scan. Again, remember that for a bone scan study, objects or um, organs that are closer to the head of the camera will appear more hot because there will be more activity coming up. So if you look at it, this is an anterior projection. This is the anterior superior iliac spine. If you look at it, you can see that it is a bit hot, okay? Now one can say that this is a hot lesion. You can sometimes call this metastasis, but remember this is not metastasis. This is because of the anatomical localization of how the anterior superior iliac spine look. It is more anterior than all the other uh, part of the body. So the closer an organ is to the camera head, the more activity comes out and the more it becomes hot. Um, so again, how you interpret a bone scan depends on your preference, but the important thing is to be consistent. You can either report from head to toe, or you can report from right to left, or you can do anterior posterior. So whichever technique that you decide, please be consistent. But the important thing is first of all, identifying. How do you identify that this is a bone scan? Because preferentially what you are seeing is the skeleton. You can absolutely say that this is the skull. You can see the skull orbit. You can see the nasal area. The nasal area has a lot of structures within it, smaller bones. That's why it is more intense. You can see the mouth. The mouth does not have a bone. That's why it looks uh, whitish. You can see the mandible, all right? Uh, you can see the shoulder. Sometimes you can see this is the, uh, the coracoid process. Again, because the coracoid process is more anterior, it is in more intense. And uh, whatever you see on a bone scan, the advantage of a bone scan is because you have the right and the left to compare. So you, they should always be symmetrical. So if you see an uptake in the right that is on the left, 
that uptake is not likely to be a pathological process. If you see an uptake only on the left-hand side and it is not projected on the right-hand side, you need to be careful and you need to look for more views and you to, need to look at it. So you have the right and left to always compare. So if you look at this patient's bone scan, for instance, you can see the coracoid process, you can see the acromion process. Again, you can see the ribs very clearly. Sometimes you can even count them. You can see the vertebrae, but you are not seeing the thoracic vertebrae more clearly here. You will see it more on the posterior. Again, the posterior here looks more hotter because the spine, this is the posterior view and this, the patient is lying on the head of the camera. We have two heads of the camera. So that's why you are seeing, again, you can see the sacro eyelid joint. It is again showing increased uptake because it is much closer to the head of the camera. So this is essentially what you do when you look at a bone scan. Be consistent in your reporting. Be able to find, to know that this is an adult patient or a younger patient. I'll show you the next slides of a younger patient. You will, the only organ that you'll see on a bone scan is renal because the pharmaceutical is excreted exclusively by the kidney. So you will see renal activity and indeed you can get a lot of information on kidney function and you can see excretion in the urinary bladder on the anterior. On the posterior, you cannot see it because the, the bladder again is anteriorly located. So again, you can see the, and this is the femur, you can see part of the, um, the tibia, and you can see the distal part of the foot. So this is a normal bone scan. This other, like I said, the hotspots that you see are areas um, of degenerative changes. And if you look at the skull, you will see that this is bilateral and, and symmetrical. So it's not likely to be pathology. If you see something that you're not very sure of, you can always ask for an additional image or you can ask for a spec three dimensional images. Um, but whatever you do, that it is always important to be consistent. So if you are reporting a bone scan, you look at the anterior and posterior projection, you either look at right and left or you go head to toe or you look at anterior and you look at posterior. So this is a normal bone scan. Now this is uh, a bone scan of a pediatric patient. Again, you can see the difference. Here you can see that there is symmetrical and bilateral uptake in the neck of the femur, in the, in the head of the femur. This represents areas of growth plate because we know growth plate has increased osteoblastic activity because of growing of the growing skeleton. You can see it's bilateral and symmetrical. Again, you can see that there is more costochondral uptake because there is still growth plate. You can see growth plate at the neck of the femur, uh, the acetabular region, the distal end of the fib, uh, femur and the tibia as well as the, uh, the foot. So this is a normal bone scan, again, an anterior and posterior projection of a pediatric patient. So the skeletal normalcy changes over time. So when you look at a bone scan, the first thing you should be able to do is to identify. Again, we can say that this is a bone scan because predominantly we can be able to see the skeleton. And the next thing is that we can be able to see the kidneys. If you're looking at the kidneys, always look at them posteriorly because we know the kidneys are retroperitoneal and therefore um, they, they are much closer to the camera head on the posterior projection. So you can see that the, you can see the kidneys and you can see the bladder. So this will confidently tell you that this is a bone scan. The second thing to do is to say that this is a whole body because we are imaging the whole body in anterior and posterior projection. And you can add by saying that this is a pediatric patient. This is demonstrated by the presence of the growth plate, unlike in the one in the adult that we see here that has no growth plate. Second thing is that sometimes you can see degenerative changes in elderly patients, which is a benign findings that you don't see in pediatric patients. So this is how you approach a bone scan. Um, it's, it's very simple to know that this is a bone scan because essentially you can see the entire skeleton and then you can see the excretion by the kidney and the urinary bladder. Now, again, in nuclear medicine, we are very colorful, so we can use any color. So don't be confused or don't panic if somebody display this kind of colors to you. There are various colors that we can use in nuclear medicine, and these colors do not change at all the interpretation or the pathology of the process. But what we have seen over the years is that depending on the type of examination that you do, there are certain colors that tends to accentuate lesions. So you can see lesions much clearer uh, with other colors um, preferentially. So you can see here, this is men are not very good with colors. I think this is, uh, my daughter told me at the time that this is a purple color. Um, sometimes you can use a red color depending on what you do, but most of the bone scan, and I'm sure the bone scan that you will encounter in your exams will be in this form. There will be the invert color, which is the black on white, or you can have a white on black, but essentially you can, you will have a black um, 
in the white on the on the white um, background. So again, this color, if you look at it, this color tends to accentuate or to bring out the it's, it's a normal bone scan, but look at how the color distribution is. So this is not a usually an ideal color to use for bone scans. Uh, this is another red color. Again, if you look at it, the first thing you will see is that this is a um, this is a bone scan because what you see is essentially the, the skeleton. You can see the ribs clearly, the vertebrae. You can see renal excretion. You can see bladder. But this is not a whole body. It is a whole body, but I will not, I will be careful to interpret this because if you see that part of the skull is missing. So anytime any part of the body is not included in the study, please be careful to interpret it as a whole body bone scan. Because if this is a patient, if this is a, uh, a breast cancer patient, for instance, with a skull metastasis, you would miss metastasis. So always ensure that before you interpret a scan, if it is a whole body scan, that the entire skeleton is visualized and no part of the body is cut off. Um, so this is it. Now, this is what we call a static view. And a static view is essentially spots view of the different part of the skeleton. Now, the advantage of a static view is that you have a better characterization because the static views take more counts, all right? So you can see clearly if you want to count the rib or if you have lesions that are very subtle that you want to see, it is better to look at it on a static view. So if you look, this is the status view of the lateral of the skull, the right lateral, left lateral, anterior, and this is anterior chest. So you can see that this, are, this is a whole body imaging but in a static view. So if you put all the static views together, it will give you a whole body scan. But again, the advantage of a static is because when we acquire the static, the, the acquisition of static imaging is different from the whole body. The whole body sweeps the patient. So the patient moves as the patient lies on the camera, the patient moves either from head to toe or from toe to head. But in a static view, the patient remains in the same position. The camera does not move and it takes significant or sufficient amount of count for you to be able to have a very good resolution. So the idea of a static imaging is to properly visualize other parts um, of the body that you need additional information. Again, static views can be black on white. Uh, it can also be displayed on various colors. So I'm going to be showing you in subsequent slides in certain pathological process, particularly if you're looking at diseases in the smaller organs, I mean, smaller structures like the hands, um, the skull, you sometimes need a static imaging to be able to see lesions or to exclude lesions um, much more clear. Now, we also have a tomographic image. A tomographic image is usually a three-dimensional image. Again, the idea of this is a rotational maximum projection image. It's also called a MIP image. And this essentially will be able to show you the rotation of the patient and you'll be able to see if they are overlying or um, structures or if you are unable to do a spec CT in a patient, sometimes you can do a tomography of a particular region of the body in order to properly visualize lesions or in order to um, differentiate lesions from underlying structures. Again, the topographic view can be either in rotation form in this three-dimensional view or they can be displayed at various images as um, short uh, static images, um, a series of images. Now, we also have the SPECT CT. Now, like I told you, the, one of the biggest problem of nuclear medicine is that we lack anatomical localization. We can see lesion, but sometimes we don't know where those lesions are. So the idea of um, also acquiring CT, um, which is not a diagnostic CT, simultaneously with the nuclear emergency imaging is purely for anatomical localization and sometimes for something we call the attenuation correction, which is a uh, topic of, that we will not go into. So if you look at this patient, this is a static view of the thorax, um, upper, upper thorax and abdomen. If you see the spine, you will see a lesion here. I would not be able to say where this lesion is. This lesion may be in the body, may be in the pedicle, may be in the spinous process. So to call this, you need to do a spec CT. So if you do a spec CT, you can see this, the CT component has provided us with a proper anatomical localization. So here we can say with confidence that this lesion is in the body. And you know that metastasis have preferential um, area of, um, of affectation. Usually metastasis goes to the pedicle, um, usually affects the pedicle, but degenerative changes usually goes to the 
uh, anterior body or it goes to the fascia joint. So the idea of combining or simultaneously acquiring the nuclear medicine and the specs and the CT component is for proper anatomical localization, um, like you can see um, from this. So again, this is a, um, a static view. Like you see, it's not a whole body view, but the static view just to show you um, the, the views and show you the pathology that we see that we need additional SPECT CT in order to absolutely localize this lesion. Now, the, the, the next component is the three-phase bone scan. Now, the three-phase bone scan is a phase of vascular phase and then the tissue phase and the bone phase. So what we are doing in three-phase bone scan is actually tracking the transit of the radiopharmaceutical. As long as soon as we inject the radiopharmaceutical into the vascular compartment, we we'll trace it into the vascular compartment. We look at it as it goes into the tissue, and then we look at it as it goes into the bony structure. So in three phase, you have the flow. Again, three phase bone scan is only done to the particular area of interest and the area of pathology, i.e. if the patient has osteomyelitis, you would want to do the three phase only to the region because you cannot do blood flow to the entire body. So you can only localize or image, you put the camera at the site of pathology, all right? So, and then the patient is injected on the table. For delayed images or for the whole body scan images, the patient is injected with the radiopharmaceutical. The patient waits for about three hours because it takes about three hours for the radiopharmaceutical to localize in the skeleton. But in the three-phase bone scan, you are injecting the patient while the patient is on the table. So that permits you to see the vascular phase and the next phase that you see, which is from five minutes usually, is the tissue phase. So at this point, the radiopharmaceutical has left the vascular compartment. It is now in the tissue phase. And then subsequently, after three hours and the delayed images, the, all the radiopharmaceutical will leave the vascular compartment. It will leave the tissue compartment and then localize um, in, the, in the bone itself. So the idea is you are looking at vascular, you are looking at tissue, and you are looking at skeleton the most important clinical indication for a three-phase bone scan is to differentiate between osteomyelitis and cellulitis because we know that cellulitis usually involve only the tissue phase. So you will have increased blood flow because it's an inflammatory process. You'll have increased tissue uptake, but the bone will be normal. So in three-phase bone scan for a positive cellulitis, you will have two phases to be positive. So the flow phase, the blood pool phase will be positive whereas the delayed phase will be negative. So you'll have an uptake of in the vascular, in the tissue, and there will be no uptake in the bone. In the other hand, if it is osteomyelitis, you'll have an increase in blood flow. You'll have an increase in tissue. And in the delayed theme or in the delayed acquisition, you will have increased uptake to that affected site. So it means that in osteomyelitis, all the three phases of the bone scans will be positive. I will show you um, examples in the subsequent slides. Now, the, it is important to identify, have, now that we have known what a bone scan is, how to identify a bone scan, the various acquisitions, that the four important acquisitions that we have, it is important for us to critically look at each of the pathological process and the pattern of disease that uh, we see with each of the disease process. Remember that each of the metastases that goes to the skeleton has each of the pathological processes have a preferential area of metastasis and a preferential type of metastasis, be it osteoblastic, which is a hotspot, or osteolytic, or it might have preferential area in the axial skeleton, or it can have preferential area in the appendicular skeleton, or both. So next subsequent slides, we will discuss those pattern of disease um, that we see in the different pathological states or condition. So I'll start with this. If you look at it, this is a single large lesion. So you can see that this lesion is hot. It is single, all right? This is not a whole view. This is just a static view of the skeleton. And this is specifically showing you this uptake in this skull. So you can see that this is a single hot spot. It's a single focal lesion in the skull, in the exhale skeleton. Again, remember that most of our patients will have come with their diagnosis. So the idea of interpreting a bone scan is not to make a primary diagnosis, is to help in staging the patient to detect the presence or otherwise um, of a skeletal metastasis. Now, if you look at the next slide, again, you can see that there is a large lytic lesion. So this is a cold lesion, which is single. Now, sometimes what happens is that you will see a cold lesion over time develop a ring 
of increased activity because as the cold region invades into or erodes into the normal bony tissue, that bony tissue reacts to the osteolytic uh, lesion. So that reaction can give you a ring um, of increased oxyblastic activity. Again, so, and over time, this becomes um, a warm lesion, but again, again, this is to show you how a single lesion that is lytic will appear. Again, in this patient, you can see that there's a mixed lesion. There's a single core lesion with a ring of yeah, increased osteoblastic activity, but you can see also that there's a linear uptake in the posterior um, first rib and, and the other rib on the side. So this patient has a multiple um, skeletal metastasis, but what is of interest here is this osteolytic activity. Now remember again at this point, like I mentioned earlier, that bone scan um, ability to pick lytic lesions is usually very poor. So each time we are putting a report uh, if we say that there is no evidence of skeletal metastasis, we usually will want to put a caveat that a bone scan has less sensitivity for osteolytic lesions, but it has very high sensitivity to osteoblastic lesions. So put that in mind. Now, this is a, a whole body image on an anterior and posterior projection of an adult because, again, you cannot see growth plate. This is clearly abnormal. Even without seeing, you can see that the uh, this is a breast cancer patient. This is a female patient because you can see the breast shadow. You can see renal excretion. But what is apparent here is that you can see that there is multiple high, multiple hot lesions involving almost the entire skeleton. All right, but mostly involving the XL skeleton, include this, including the skull, multiple ribs, multiple vertebrae, multiple spine, and again you can see a very notorious single lesion here. Uh, at the mid shaft of the right femur. Now, apart from detecting metastasis, one of the important things that bone scan does is to determine areas that are likely um, or are susceptible to fractures. So if I want to report this bone scan, I will say that this is an whole body bone scan in an adult patient, probably a female patient, and there is multiple hot lesions of varying sizes and intensities involving the skull, the vertebrae, multiple bilateral ribs, the proximal uh, appendic appendicular skeleton, and I will specifically mention those lesions that are the in the weight variant areas because these are lesions that have potential um, for pathological fracture, and therefore the oncologist will quickly intervene before the patient's fractures. So this is what you see in patients with multiple skeletal metastasis. Now, the, one of the most important and difficulty that most registrars encounter is when you have lesions in the rib. Now, metastasis to the rib look linear. They follow the contour, all right? They follow, usually follow the contour of the rib, whereas other lesions, which I'll show you subsequently, uh, are either focal and they have a preferential area. So if you look at this, this is widespread. Both anterior and posterior ribs are involved, involved bilaterally. And you can see that these lesions are elongated, all right? You look at them, they are, they are elongated. Once you see an elongated lesion in the rib, this lesion is likely be due to metastasis. And I'll show you in subsequent slide how you can differentiate the other lesions, particularly um, lesions in the rib. Now, this is again showing you uh, an example of a patient. Again, here is a whole body bone scan because you can see the skeleton clearly. You can see the kidneys and bladder excretion. And then uh, you, this is an adult patient and the entire patient is within the field of view of image. No part of the patient is cut off. So this is a very good bone scan of an, uh, bone scan of an adult. Again, this is multiple skeletal metastasis. These are multiple hot spots. Again, you can see they are linear and they involve all the part of the skeleton. Now, on the other hand, I'm showing you on the next slides how trauma looks in the rib. Now, traumas are usually focal and they are aligned, they are arranged in linear fashion because trauma, and they are usually, they usually affect the costal rib because the costal ribs are the sites of preference to trauma because the costal part of the rib, there is no significant muscles. So those areas are more susceptible to trauma. So trauma usually, they are focal, they are rounded, they are intense, and the lesions are arranged in linear fashion. So this is how you differentiate a metastasis from a fracture. Again, I'm going to show you subsequent disease, how you will differentiate it. So, but anytime you see lesions that are round and they are arranged in a linear fashion in the coastal region of this side or this side, these are lesions that are consistent um, with fractures. And um, this is how the fracture looks on the bone scan, unlike the 
linear appearances and widespread um, in, continu in continuous same thing that you see with, the, with metastasis um, in patients with metastasis. Now again, this um, slide shows you the three most difficult rib lesions that, uh, that you need to differentiate. Now, if you look at it, this is a patient with multiple skeletal metastases. Again, these are static views, all right? If you look at this patient, you'll see that there are multiple abnormal increased uptake involving bilateral ribs, anterior and posterior. You can see them, they are elongated. This shows you that these are metastases. If it is trauma, it is usually arranged in linear fashion. If you see lesions in the costochondral margin, these lesions are either are mainly due to metabolic bone disease. Metabolic bone disease like hyperparathyroidism, like renal osteodystrophy or osteomalacia. And I'm going to show you how you will be able to, on a whole body bone scan, be able to say in each of these diseases, there are other things that you look out in the skeleton that tells you that this costochondral uptake is due to hyperparathyroidism or is due to renal osteodystrophy. Now remember again that you can in elderly patients who have costochondral calcification because the MDP localizes or is taken up by areas that has calcium. That's why we see the skeleton. Sometimes you can see costochondrial calcification or costochondritis will also give you this kind of pattern. But usually they are more in the part of the costal region or like what you see here. So again, metastasis, a lesion in the, in the, due to metastasis are random, they are widespread, they don't follow any fashion, and they are linear. Lesions that are due to trauma, they follow a linear fashion, they are usually in the costal and the areas that are prone to fracture, they are focal, they are intense. Lesions that are due to metabolic disease on the rib, they are usually costal, they are usually focal, again, they are usually arranged um, in linear fashion um, following the cost of the rib. Again, I'm going to show you in subsequent slides the other features that you need to look out, particularly if you want to differentiate the various um, metabolic bone diseases. Now, this is the next um, appearance that you can have or the next pattern of disease process that you can have in a bone scan. This is called the super scan. And a super scan is a widespread uptake involving the entire skeleton. So in this circumstance, because there is increased uptake, this, this scan looks very intense, it looks super. And one of the most important future that you see in a super scan is that there is absence of the kidney, all right? You will not visual this kidney because there is so much metastasis within the skeleton that the metastasis has taken up all the radiopharmaceutical that you inject and then you don't see uh, the kidneys again. Or sometimes you can see them um, very, very faintly depending on the color. You can see this is the same patient, but with this color you can see that it has accentuated it, that you can see a little bit of the kidney, but in this, you cannot completely see this kidney. So this is a pattern that you see. Again, remember that a super scan does not only occur in metastasis, you can have super scan that can come from metabolic bone disease, such as renal osteodystrophy or hyperparathyroidism. And again, again I'm going to show you uh, when we get to this, how you'll be able to differentiate super scans that are from metast um, malignancies and super scans that are from other benign or metabolic bone disease. So super scans are usually seen in patients with prostate CA, and that's what you see. You see intense uptake involving almost entire the skeleton. Sometimes it tends to preserve um, certain organs, like, I mean, certain regions of the skeleton, like the skull, but what it shows is that it's widespread, it's extensive, it's unilateral, uh, and it involves purely the entire skeleton. Again, when you look at super scan, please note, always remember to identify those areas that are at risk um, of pathological fractures. It, reach, it makes your report rich and it uh, makes your examiner, if you're on exams, to know that you are aware that one of the advantages of bone scan, not only to detect metastasis, but also to detect some of the complications that this metastasis may cause to the skeleton. Again, this is uh, another example of a super scan. This is a whole body image in anterior and posterior projection. The anterior projection is this and the posterior projection is this. Look at how beautiful this looks. So this is a beautiful, that is why it is called a beautiful bone scan because there is homogeneous, intense optic, um, intense metastatic infiltration of the bone. So all the radiopharmaceutical uh, is localized within the metastatic region in the skeleton that is involved. And then again, you would not see the kidneys, all right? So this is a super scan. 
and this is a super scan from a patient with a prostate cancer. You can see that there's elevation of the urinary bladder, then, uh, and this is a male patient. Sometimes, if you look properly at a bone scan, you'll be able to differentiate, not only is differentiating that this is an adult patient, but you can be able to say with certainty that this is either a male or a female, uh, looking at the various shape of the pelvis or the suprapubic lesion that will show you that this is a male or a female. Again, sometimes we can, if we want to be sure, we can do more static images, all right, to visualize the kidney or to have an appearance of, um, to have more counts and to have more activity coming up so that we can properly visualize. Again, in this patient, you barely can see, um, so you can see the kidney. So if you are encountered with this kind of scan, First thing to say is to identify that this is a whole body bone scan of an adult patient. If you want to get more marks, you can say whether it's an, a male, this is a male patient. There is diffused increased uptake involving the entire skeleton and the kidney is not visualized. This appearance is consistent with a super scan. All right, and a super scan means that there is infiltration involving the entire skeleton. But again, remember that super scan can also happen in um, non-malignant situations such as um, malignant, I mean, um, metabolic bone disease, but I'll tell you how to differentiate them um, when we get to that. Again, another example of a beautiful bone scan. Uh, here again, you can see that this is a whole body bone scan in anterior and posterior projection of an adult patient, most likely a male patient. Um, again, you can see that there is infiltration. It looks beautiful, like the name implies, because there is infiltration, there is prominence of all. So sometimes one of the confusing things is that you will not see a focal or linear uptake. All you will see is this diffuse uptake. So this will go for a normal scan. There are so many people who have made a mistake of reporting this as a normal scan. But what gives it out is the absence of the kidney. Once you see a scan that looks so beautiful to you and you don't see the kidneys, please be wary because this is one of the most important features that you can see in a false negative scan. So you also always have to be wary. You always have to look at the skeleton. You have to look at the right and the left to be symmetrical. You have to look and be able to see where the kidneys are. So anytime you don't see the kidneys, um, you should be worried. And you see this homogeneous, intense uptake, usually involving the axial, uh, the axial skeleton that points to a super scan. Now, additional things that you'll see to differentiate the other super scan, the cause of other super scan, um, I'll show you in subsequent slides. Now, in lung cancer, you can have a different uh, pattern of metastasis. Now, again, this is a 46-year-old male patient diagnosed with an adenocarcinoma of the lung, and he's sent for a bone scan to exclude the presence or to detect the presence of metastasis. Now, if you look at this, this is a whole body bone scan. But again, for, don't remember that part of this has been cut off, all right? So be careful if you want to interpret this scan you need an additional view because this is not a proper whole body, body scan because you are not seeing the, in, the entire um, part of the, of the upper limb. You can ask for an additional view. Now, if you look at this, there is the kidneys are present. This is a beautiful scan. You can see the rib clearly. You can see the entire skeleton clearly. You can see the kidneys clearly. But if you look very closely, you can see that in the part of the femur, you have this linear uptake. All right, linear irregular optic, and that's why we do static. You can see this uh, static anterior and posterior. The static because they have more count, the image resolution is better. So you can see this linear optic, and this is a typical appearance of the hypertrophic pulmonary osteoarthropathy. So patients who have pulmonary disease will usually present with this kind of pattern. So this patient do not have a typical appearance of a metastasis. There is no focal optic to suggest metastasis but there is this linear uptake that is consistent with the HPAO, that is the hypertrophic uh, pulmonary osteoarthropathy. And this is typically in patients with obstructive airway disease or patients with chronic uh, lung disease or particularly patients with um, lung CA. So these are sometimes some of the uh, patterns um, that you can be able to see and it's important to recognize them. Once you see a whole body scan and uh, you see areas again, like I, like I told you, it should be bilateral and symmetrical, and you begin to see irregular uptake at the cortical region that you're not very clear of, you always ask for a static view. So in an exam, if you're encountered with this, you, you can say that you would need an additional uh, static views of this area. And oftentimes the examiners will have it and then it will be very clear that there's a linear uptake. So the description here is, there is a linear cortical uptake involving the medial aspect 
of the right femur, and this is consistent with hypertrophic pulmonary osteoarthropathy. Um, another bone scan, whole body bone scan um, of an adult patient. Again, this is whole body because the entire skeleton is within the field of view. You can clearly say that this is whole um, bone scan because you can make up for all the skeletal system. You can see excretion in the kidney. But what is pathological here is that you can see that there's an intense increase for uptake involving the distal end of the um, right fibula. Now, uh, this kind of finding is consistent usually with osteogenic sarcoma. So the idea of patients with osteogenic sarcoma is to identify, is to help localize the lesion, but more importantly is to also look for areas of metastasis because the therapy of patients with osteogenic sarcoma would largely depend on the presence or absence of skeletal metastasis. Like in this patient, they usually will benefit from above knee amputation because there is no any evidence of metastasis. Again, if you look at it from the skull, this is the vertex of the skull. This is part of the lacrimal gland because the lacrimal gland also excretes. So in some patient, you will see lacrimal gland. Again, you see this a focal optic here. You can see it, so it's bilateral and symmetrical. Anytime you see an optic that is bilateral and symmetrical, it is not likely to be a pathological process. This is the dental of the patient. And sometimes patients who have dental caries or patients who have undergone any dental procedure because there is increased osteoblastic activity at the dental region, you will sometimes see dental uptake. These are not metastases and these are not pathology. Uh, sometimes you can identify that this is a young adult because you can see an uptake because one of the last organ uh, bony structure to completely ossify is the sternomanumbra joint. So you can see that this is a young patient. Probably this patient is about 18 or 19. And you can see the sternal angle. You can see part of this is focal, is un uh, symmetrical and bilateral. If I only see this without this, then I get worried. All right, again, remember I said the structures that are more closer to the camera will appear more, more intense. So you can, that's why you see that the anterior superior hallux spine is more intense because it's more anterior. The sacroiliac joint, it's triangular, it's butterfly shape, it's usually post because it is posterior, this is posterior view, it is more accentuated. So in this patient, he has an intense optic in, um, in, in the distal light femur with no any evidence of skeletal metastasis. Already this patient is known um, to have a primary osteogenic sarcoma. He was sent primarily to see if there is metastasis or not. Again, um, another example of the same patient, another patient is, uh, with osteogenic sarcoma. You can see that there is intense uptake. This uptake is irregular. It is usually, the, this is the preferential site for primary osteogenic sarcoma. It's usually in the young adults. It usually affects the distal femur, uh, femur. But in this patient, additionally, apart from identifying the area of intense of the primary site, you can see from head to toe that there is a focal lesion here. There is one around the neck of the, of the humerus. There is one around the coastal region of the, of the rib. So um, you can see the sacroiliac joint, there is asymmetrical uptake, so there is also intense uptake. And you can see also in the distal part of the humerus. So this patient has a widespread skeletal metastasis. Apart from that, you can also see that there is a abnormal uptake in the apex of the lung. There are certain soft tissue malignancies or metastases that sometimes take off. MDP. And the reason why they take up MDP is because they have calcification. And remember that osteogenic sarcoma uh, metastasis usually has calcification. So, and this is more in the posterior, and that's why you can see intense uptake. So, just looking at this bone scan, it is extremely sensitive. It shows you all the pathology, but you need to improve your specificity. It is not specific. Anything can give you this kind of distribution. But the idea of looking at a bone scan is with each of this pattern that you see, you will increase your specificity. So at the end of the day, when you are putting your report, your report should be 100% sensitive and close to 100% um, specific. So additionally, you can also see that at the, in addition to the multiple skeletal metastases that this patient has, there is also metastasis to the lung because you can see it here. So this patient will not benefit from amputation. He will rather do um, other forms of therapy will be done for the patient. Now again, bone scan can be used not only in osteogenic sarcoma, it's not only used for the detection of metastasis, but it's also used for follow-up of patients. Patients who have had uh, above knee amputation, we need to follow them up for evidence of reoccurrence at the stomp site or metastasis to the rest of the skeleton. So this is usually in this kind of patient, we would like to do a blood pool. So we do the two-phase bone scan. 
we do the blood pool whole body image and we do the static image. So if you look at it, this is the blood pool of the patient. This is the tissue phase just before the delayed phase. And this is the delayed phase. In this delayed phase, you can see that this is a skeleton and this patient had had a benoni amputation. But if you look closely, you will see that there's uptake around the part of the repair. This is likely uh, to represent metastasis to the lung. So this patient has been had an um, um, uh, above knee amputation, but after the surgical procedure and his subsequent follow-up, there was evidence of metastasis to the lung. And then osteogenic sarcoma, obviously the most common site apart from the skeleton, the preferential organ that gets metastasis is the, is the lung tissue. Now, another example of a 19-year-old young man who has osteogenic sarcoma and had an above knee amputation has been, been follow up. This is five years after his amputation. And uh, he was sent for a bone scan because there was a worry of a reoccurrence at the site um, of the stump. Again, if you see, compared to the previous patient who didn't have any uptake, abnormal uptake at the site of the amputation, at the site of surgery, you can see in this patient that there is an increase in uptake, which is irregular. So this represents an area of reoccurrence. But the good news for this patient is that both the anterior and posterior projection did not show any evidence um, for skeletal metastasis. Uh, again, whole body scan. You can see clearly most of the tissues of the body. You can see the kidneys. And again, you can say with confidence that this is a young adult, I mean, a young, young uh, individual because of the growth plate um, in both sides, I mean, in, in the major joints. So again, apart from detecting metastasis, bone scan is being utilized for follow-up of patients um, post-operatively or follow-up of patients who have had some form of therapy. Now, in, in the course of therapy, there is something referred to as a flare phenomenon, which can be very confusing sometimes when you are interpreting a bone scan. And following any form of therapy, be it chemotherapy or radiation therapy, to a patient who has already documented metastasis, because of reaction to the therapy, there is usually increased blood flow and increased oxyblaxia activity that happens following therapy. And this will appear as worsening in the skeleton. And this is something we need to be worried about. So this is a flare phenomenon. This is an example of a patient with a breast cancer. If you see, this is the anterior, and this is the, post, the projection of the patient, posterior projection. I'm just using the posterior projection at the initial time of di diagnosis. So this is a staging scan. And you can see that there are two, one, two, three, four lesions within the spine. This represents areas of metastasis. And this patient had subsequently had therapy. And Three months after therapy, she was requested for a bone scan because of pain. And again, the unfortunate thing is that most patients who will experience flare phenomenon, apart from the bone scan increasing in intensity, their symptom also tends to worsen. Their symptom worsen, there is worsening of pain because there is increased blood flow and there is increased vascularity. So if you look at it, what has happened is that again, there is increase in flow. So you can see this is, this is usually not because the patient has increased or progression of disease, but is usually because this patient over time developed a flare phenomenon. So flare phenomenon is one of the things that you can do, but one important thing is to follow up this patient till up to six months. And after six months, you will usually see that there is resolution um, of the flare phenomenon. Like I'll show you an example, this patient at the staging scan, three months and six months. So you can see it's a whole body bone scan of an adult patient. This patient has multiple skeletal metastases that looks like an um, early form of a super scan, but then the kidneys are visualized. But two months after therapy, patient had terrible pains. And you can see that there is more lesions. The lesions are more accentuated. They flared up. All right. So this is what you see. So normally what we do in this patient, that style, so that's why history here is very important. The clinical state of the patient is very important. And the stage in bone scan is also very important to determine whether this is indeed a flare phenomenon or not. But this bone scan was repeated six months after, and you can see there is almost complete disappearance of those lesions that had flare up any, um, earlier on. So flare phenomenon is something you need to look at and you need to be wary about whenever you are interpreting a bone scan. Do not attempt at interpreting a flare phenomenon if you don't have both, the, at least three scans or two scans, the staging scan, the therapy scan, post-therapy scan, and, and usually the six-month scan. Now, um, apart from the flare phenomenon, there are certain patients with documented skeletal metastasis that are followed up with other forms of radionuclide therapy. I will not go today into detail of radionuclide therapy, but there's something called Samarium. It's a radiopharmaceutical that we use 
for bone pain palliation. And this radioform skull is the patient's pain and sometimes also um, cures the skeletal metastasis. And this, in this kind of patients, you can see, we always follow them six months after because of the um, likelihood of having a flare phenomenon. So this is a patient with a prostate CA. At this point, when this patient was seen, the PSA was 530. You can see a whole body bone scan. You can see multiple intense uptake. They look mostly like a beautiful scan because you also cannot see the kidneys. Now this patient had samarium therapy, and this is what has happened after six months. So in April 2017 was when we saw this patient, and the patient then had a six months follow-up scan, and you could see that there is almost complete disappearance um, of the skeletal lesion. So one scan, apart from detecting um, the presence or absence of metastasis, can be used also for follow-up of patients. Another, another example is a prostate cancer patient. This is the baseline scan. You can see in a different color, whole body, the skeleton, you can see the kidneys and bladder excretion. Yeah, but again, more importantly, you can see that there is widespread skeletal metastasis. This patient received samarium, and six months later, you can see that there is almost complete disappearance of this lesion that we see. So at this page, we will say that this patient has completely recovered or there is a complete um, resolution of those lesions. So again, important thing to note here that apart from detecting um, the presence or otherwise of uh, skeletal metastasis, bone scan plays a very significant role in monitoring patients who are in therapy for skeletal lesions. Now, primary bone disease. The bone scan is not a tool for the diagnosis of primary bone disease. It is usually helpful to characterize lesions. Usually these patients would have had some of either a radiograph or a CT that will show a lesion. But then the importance of a bone scan is to characterize this lesion, is to choose the site, the suitable site for biopsy and to stage the patient, i.e. to look for skeletal metastasis. So primarily bone scan is not a tool for the primary diagnosis. Instead, it is used again like in other um, like breast or prostate is used for follow-up, but in addition, in primary bone disease, we use bone scan to choose the site of biopsy if the biopsy is equivocal or not sure, and we can stage the patient. So this is an example that I would like to show you. The most common benign bone lesion that we encounter in clinical practice is patients with osteoid osteoma, and it has a typical appearance in a bone scan. This is a static view of a young individual. It is, he's young because you can see the growth plate in the femur. But what you can see is this focal uptake with a surrounding low intensity uptake. And this is called a double density sign. Uh, double density because the center of it, which is the center of the nidus, if you remember, you can also see the nidus on the plain x-rays or on the CT. The central area of nidus is highly vascular and there's a lot of osteoblastic activity that happens. And then the surrounding area will also have a mild uptake. So you have a double density sign. Um, this is very pathognomonic of patients with osteoma. And again, it is important to interpret the scan in view of the patient clinical history. And we know how the typical clinical history of a patient with osteoma is. They have severe pain usually at night, and this pain is relieved usually by a, a salicylic acid. So this is an area of localization. One of the importance of a bone scan, again, is to use, you can use it to biopsy, you can use it to look for other areas, secondary areas of uh, involvement, um, and then you can use it for follow-up um, of, of therapy in this, um, in this kind of patients. Another example, again, young individual, static view of um, the distal, the, the lower limb, you can see the growth plate, but again, you can see a focal increase area of uptake. This is where we need additional images. You see, if you look at the CT, it corresponds to an area of a lytic lesion, and you can see the central area of nidus, um, this is typically what we see in patients with osteoderma. Again, like I said, anatomical images such as radiograph and CT are enough to make a diagnosis of most primary bone disease, but the role of a bone scan is to look at the extent of the disease, to choose a site of a biopsy, and of course to see if there are other similar lesions in other parts um, of the body. Now, if you look at this x-ray, you are better with this x-ray than myself, but if you look at it, this is a proximal part of the femur, um, the distal part of the humerus, you can see that there is a large osteolytic lesion, and this patient already uh, has been seen, and there were several differentials. The most significant differential in this patient is fibrous dysplasia, all right? And fibrous dysplasia is one of the benign bone tumors that has an intense uptake. So the idea of doing a bone scan in this patient is to see the degree of uptake 
is to choose the site of biopsy and to see if the other part of the skeleton has a similar lesion. So this patient had a radiograph and look at this large lytic lesion. The patient had a whole body bone scan. You can see whole body bone scan and adult patients, anterior posterior projection. And look at the intense uptake. So fibrous dysplasia is one of the few benign tumors that shows you intense uptake. The intense uptake is almost similar to what you see in patients with osteogenic sarcoma. But in osteogenic sarcoma, there is a preferential area. It is associated with complete with destruction of the bone and irregularity. But, and it has a preferential um, areas, but fibrous dysplasia has an elongated uptake and intense uptake. And usually fibrous dysplasia, the extent of the disease is underestimated, usually on the plane radiograph. So this is how the plane radiograph is. But you can see how intense and how extensive um, that this lesion looks like um, in, in the bone scan. And if, again, you can see that there's a similar focal lesion just above this, which indicates that there's, that there's extension but good news for the patient is that the rest of the skeleton did not show any evidence of metastasis and it did not show any evidence of a similar lesion um, in the skeleton. Now for metabolic bone disease, the four most important metabolic bone disease that we, were, that we are able to visualize on a bone scan is hyper, primary hyperparathyroidism, renal osteodystrophy, Paget's disease, and osteomalacia. And I tell you, by the end of the slides, you would be able to, on a bone scan, even though we say bone scan has low specificity, but there are certain telltale signs that you will look at that will be able to differentiate this, uh, this disease entities. So the first on my list is the patient with papa parathyroidism. This is a whole body bone scan of a patient in anterior and posterior projection. Again, like I mentioned before, one of the typical findings that you get in patients with hyperparathyroidism is costochondrial calcification and costochondrial uptake. You can see it is uniform. It is following the costochondrial region. But in addition, there is also intense uptake involving the skull. You will have intense uptake involving the mostly the periarticular. You can see that there's a periarticular uptake. All right, but the kidneys are preserved in this particular patient. So this combined with the history of the patient, again, this is a female patient, hyperparathyroidism is more common in females. You can see this is a breast tissue. So the combination of the history, the laboratory finding, and the pattern of this disease will give you the diagnosis. And that's why, again, at this point, I would like to mention that in nuclear medicine, we do not give differentials. Um, as much as possible, we will give the diagnosis as much as possible because we have a t there is a typical pattern that this disease process um, follow. So again, to remind you, costochondrial classification, uptake in the calvarium, or periarticular uptake, and preservation oftentimes of the kidney. So this is typical of patients with primary um, hyperparathyroidism. Now, if you look at this, this is, uh, again, an adult patient, whole body bone scan in anterior and posterior projection. Sometimes we do a lateral of the head in order to properly look at the calvarium. So again, in this patient, you will see that there is intense uptake. It looks very beautiful bone scan. There is absence of the kidney. There is intense uptake involved in the calvarium. You can see it very clearly. And you can see also that there is costochondrial uptake and in the linear fashion, similar to what we see in renal, in, in patient with primary hyperparathyroidism. But in this patient, there is absent kidney. And another thing that points is that if you look at it in this side, the part of the right iliac fossa, you will see an increased uptake. So that tells you that this patient has a renal disease. This patient had renal transplant, all right? And this is typical in patients. This is a typical appearance of a renal osteodystrophy. So again, you will not be wrong if you are asking an exam, if you describe, the most important thing is to describe. This is not metastasis. That is the most important thing because there is intense calvarial uptake. There is costochondrial uptake, all right? And the kidneys are absent. Um, there is periarticular uptake. So this is not metastasis. This is likely metabolic disease. Now, putting everything in place, you can look again that this kidney is absent. This patient has a renal transplant. So all this clinical history will point to us um, a renal, um, renal osteodystrophy. Now, again, um, I'd like to show you what this, in, in this kind of patient, again, you can see that this is a whole body bone scan in this patient. You can see this is the type that is a little bit confusing. You can see that there's multiple uptake, they are focal, some of them are linear, all right? They are scattered all over. Again, you can, but one of the things that you will able to differentiate this kind is this, this is a patient with an osteomalacia because patient with osteomalacia, 
will have multiple rib fractures. They will have up to the rib fractures are scattered, not like the ones you have following trauma. They can sometimes be linear. But what is important is that you will see other evidences or other futures of compression fracture. And one of the most common one that is very patonymonic is the sacral insufficiency fracture. So if you look at it, you can see it's called a Honda sign. Remember the Honda motor car, the H sign of the Honda. So once you see this with this kind of pattern, so it tells you that this is likely a pathological fracture from osteomyelitis. You can see how it is. So again, without additional view. So if I only have this, um, if I only have a static view of the chest without a history, without any clinical future, without any laboratory findings, it's difficult to say whether this is metastasis or this is multiple uh, pathological fractures from osteomyelitis. Um, but again, if you look at it, you'll see uh, the Honda sign is signifying that there is also an insufficient uh, sacral fracture. So this is um, futures that we see in patients um, with osteomyelitis. So again, another example of another patient. Again, you can see that there are multiple. Some of them arrange in linear fashion. Some of them are focal. But none of them is linear to show that this is metastasis. Again, and then you will see that there is linear uptake involved the vertebra. So this is compression fraction. All right, this is a compression fracture. And then if you look at the sacrum, you will see the Honda sign. So once you see this kind of pattern, and additional evidences of structures in other parts of the body that tells you that this is likely um, a diagnosis of osteomyelitis. So again, what is important is not only looking at the pattern of the disease, but looking at the other part of the body that will help you support your diagnosis. You will hardly have a lesion like this without uh, fractures or insufficiency fractures happening in other parts of the body. Um, so this is important to to note. Now for primary bone disease, one of the commonest that we encounter all in our day-to-day -day practice is Paget's disease. And Paget's disease has a typical appearance. The, usually the uptake is extremely intense and it is associated with deformity. So if you see, these are two different patients. This is anterior and posterior. You can see that there is intense uptake. You can see the pelvis in the pelvic region. There is increased uptake and it's usually in the hemipelvis involved in the hemi, in, uh, the commoner side is the hemipelvis, but you can have monoarthritic or uh, multiple fo multifocal disease. Remember this is injection site, okay? Um, so the, this is typically what we see in patients with Paget disease, intense uptake, it is ex associated with expansion of the bone and sometimes associated with deformity. This is very part of mnemonic um, of patients with Paget's disease. So the idea of doing a bone scan or the indication of bone scan in patients with Paget's disease is to confirm the diagnosis, to look at the extent to other part of the body that is involved, and also to follow up um, therapy because following up a therapy picture or appearance also differ. So again, the most important future is the hemipelvis. It is usually unilateral. There is associated expansion and there's associated um, deformity of the affected bone. Another example, again, okay, another one, it's a whole body bone scan of an adult patient uh, clearly, you can see that there is excretion in the kidney, but what is, com what is very apparent is this intense uptake associated with expansion, associated with some form of deformity. This has oftentimes been confused with osteogenic sarcoma. Osteogenic sarcoma does not have this intense uptake, and the uptake is usually irregular. It does not come with expansion of the bone. It is not this intense and it does not usually come with deformity. So, and again, the age of the patient is one of the things that you consider. If you look at all the other patients that I've shown you uh, in the previous slides, most of them are young individuals. Um, this is, so this is a, a patient with documented Paget's disease, but in addition to that, there's also affectation of the left hemipelvis. So there are two areas of disease um, that, that is seen. In this second patient, again, you can see there's this intense uptake associated with expansion of the bone uh, and deformity. So the key point to note in patients with Paget's disease is once you look at the scan, you will see that the bone is intense. The uptake is so intense. Uh, and then there's expansion of the bone. And oftentimes, depending on this, the bone affected and the stage of the disease, there will be some form of um, deformity. Now, this takes me to the next, um, uh, the next portion of the imaging modality that we do for 
um, the indication that for bone scan is in skeletal infection and the most important clinical indication really is to differentiate, like I said earlier on, between cellulitis and osteomyelitis because we know the difference. Um, the treatment model, the treatment options are not the same. We do a three-phase bone scan in patients with cellulitis, in suspected um, cellulitis or osteomyelitis. So this is a flow phase. Um, this is the bus, this is the tissue phase, and this is the bone phase. So you can see that this is the first phase, second phase, and third phase. So in this patient, you can already see that there's increased vascular, there's increased blood flow to the area. There's increased tissue activity and there is increased bone. So this is typical of what we see in patients with osteomyelitis. So all the three phase of the bone scan will be positive. But if you have a patient who has a positive increased blood flow, increased tissue activity, and then there is no uptake in the, in the bone, that means that this is cellulitis. But this patient, the, the three phase of the study were positive, and that tells you that this is um, the osteomyelitis. Again, in osteomyelitis, like I said, if you're doing three-phase bone scan, the first two phase of the bone scan are usually done as static. They are done at the area of a symptom. You can then do delayed of the entire skeleton to look for evidence of multifocal disease. Um, but for comparison's sake, we usually would want to do a static, more good quality imaging um, in this type of patients. So this is a positive scan for uh, osteomyelitis. Now, if you look at this, uh, again, another patient with uh, pain, <clears throat> pain in the lower leg, now, if you see that there is in this blood flow, and the blood flow images are so many because they are images that are acquired um, in dynamic forms. So if you look at it here, you can see that there's a subtle increase in blood flow to this area compared to this. So there's asymmetric uptake already you can see in the blood flow. In the tissue phase, you can see intense uptake in the tissue, all right? But in the delayed, there's complete normal delayed. So this is typical of cellulitis. So cellulitis, only the two phases of the bone scan is positive. There is increased blood flow, there is increased tissue activity, but then the bone is normal. So this is why we, uh, this is very um, pathognomonic of, of cellulitis. And this is very critical to, to differentiate between these two disease entity, of course, because the therapy options are different. Now in skeletal trauma, um, bone scan has played a significant role in detecting stress fractures and sheen spleen. But again, majority of these indications uh, has been taken over by, by MRI. But in places where MRI is not available, um, sometimes bone scan can play a key role. And again, what we do in this kind of patient is to do a three-phase bone scan. We look at the vascular flow. This is an example of a patient who presented with a pain with a, uh, a 19, 20-year-old gentleman who is a footballer and presented with severe pain in the lower limb, uh, his x-rays were normal. So we did a flow study. You can see that his flow is normal. I cannot see any evidence uh, of an, an abnormal localization. We usually put a marker sometimes here to say whether this is right or this is a left. You can see here this space where the arrow is. Now, if you look at this is the first phase, which looks normal. Look at the second phase, the tissue phase. If you see the tissue phase, there is increased, slightly increased optic, um, asymmetrical optic involved in the left. Sometimes you need to do additional images to be able to see either you do a lateral view to properly localize it. So this is the tissue phase, which is positive. And then if you look subsequently, you will see that there is a focal area of increased optic. Now this corresponds to an area of stress fracture. Stress fracture is usually focal, it is usually oval, and it's usually involved in the cortical of the bone depending on the grade. You know, remember we can have different grade. We have grade one, localized to the cortex, grade two and grade three, which is uh, transcortical. But usually these cortical, the stress fractures are usually cortical, they are focal, um, again, they are usually oval. And they will have either the entire three-phase bone scan will be positive or the tissue and the delayed images will show um, this intense uptake. So this is what you see in patients um, with the stress fracture. In the other way, sometimes you can see a linear uptake of activity. Again, you can see this is, a, this is an athletic uh, who have a young man with, who has been running um, and complain of severe pains in the lower limb. Again, his x-rays were normal. But then if you look at the bone scan of the lower limb, what, will, what is striking is that you can see this linear uptake of activity. This is different from what we see in the hypertrophic 
pulmonary osteoarthropathy that affects the cortical region. This is usually affecting um, the posterior or the anterior or the posterior tibial region. You can see it is linear, it is intense. Again, it is associated with a round, large, oval lesion. Once you see an oval cortical lesion, you can see it's oval, it's cortical, this corresponds to usually um, a stress fracture. So this patient has a shin spleen as well as a stress fracture. Again, here, the history will guide you to localizing this kind of um, pathological process and the distribution and pattern will also help you. Again, like I said, this is only a static view that we took. You need to look at the whole body to see if there are similar lesions elsewhere in the body, but this is where the symptom um, of this patient is. Now, I, will, uh, I have really gone through most of the basic um, pathological process that we encounter on our day-to-day -day practice when we do bone scans, but I'll then uh, flip through a little bit to show you some few images um, to see if you will be able to identify some. So this is a 69-year-old male who presented with a low back pain. His x-ray was normal, and he has smoked uh, 40 pack here. Um, so they're thinking of um, long CA, and this is his bone scan. Is there anyone who wants to attempt? Hello? Hello? Yes, Dr. Jawa. No, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, anyone uh, wants to? Uh, yes. Is there anyone who wants to make an attempt at uh, discussing this, describing this, this Dr. study? Uh, Doctor Amir Nabawi. Yes. Yes. Uh, here yes, you doctor. So thank you for a very uh, nice uh, lecture and the great effort uh, from Doctor Jawa. Um, I'm represented with the whole body bone scan um, uh, with that with the MDT uh, MDB um, and I'm represented with uh, with uh, multiple uh, uh, high tracer uptake right. in, uh, in in the, uh, in the I think this uh, uh, right uh, fourth rib or um, Good. Uh, left rib right okay Right. right, okay, and also I can appreciate another uh, high tracer uptake in the uh, um, in the right and the left uh, in the left femur Good. Uh, shaft. Right. Okay. Um, um, also for the skull, for the um, for the vertebrae, um, I I can see uh, two uh, multiple uh, multiple focal. Um, uh, a tracer uptake involving the multiple uh, dorsal and lumbar vertebrae. Right. Uh, so regarding uh, the history of the uh, of the patient, and my finding, uh, my constellation is uh, uh, is going with the uh, bone uh, mitts. Also, I can see uh, also in uh, but maybe it's from the ankle joint. So, uh, so my um, yes, it's present at the at the proximal and distal uh, leg uh, or right. tibia. Uh, so my uh, this is a bone metastasis, um, um, uh, bone metastasis infiltrating uh, of the vertebrae of the uh, uh, of the upper and lower uh, um, of the femur and also of the bus tibia. Um, good. Okay. Okay, good. So I'm very happy with your description. First, you are able to identify that this is a bone scan of an adult. Uh, you, are ex you are able to identify that it's a whole body view because the entire skeleton is within the view of the uh, You are able to identify the rib lesion as well as those lesions in the, um, in the, in the, in the lower limb. But again, if you look very subtle, there are small two lesions in the mid shaft of the femur. And yes. Okay, so this is, but again, one, one of the important things is that when you are putting your report, please always raise a flag, always emphasize that this lesion is in a, in a, in a uh, weight bearing area. So there's a potential of a pathological fracture. So you will, you will get yes. additional mark by doing that, all right? Yes. Okay. okay, and also remember that anytime you see lesions in an elderly, in a, in a male, in a patient, usually around the joint spaces, these are usually due to degenerative changes. So I will not call this mm. metastasis. This is likely degenerative in the, um, in the tibia. And here again, if you look at it on the foot, it's likely degenerative well, metastasis. You. Exactly. Metastasis usually do not go to those areas of the skeleton. Okay. Um, okay. 
I agree with you that there is irregular uptake involving the spine. So in this kind of circumstances, please always remember that you will need to ask for an additional view because we don't know mm. whether these are degenerative or whether they are malignancy. So you need a spec CT. The spec CT mm. will give you a three-dimensional view. If it is malignancy, you will see this uptake in the pedicle. All right? Mm -hmm. If it is mm. degenerative, it will be in the anterior surface and it will correspond to areas of osteophytic change, osteophytes. All right? Yes. Okay. okay, so always whenever you see irregular uptake in the part of the lumbar spine or in the spine, always ask for an additional spec so that the spec will give you a three-dimensional view because there is no way you will be able to say whether this lesion is degenerative or it is metastasis. This Again, is in all, all um, bone scan, Dr. Gawa? Yes, because I said, the, yeah, I said this patient is 69. Yeah. Yeah, all right. So if I say this patient is 13 or, or young individual and you see that, then you will be worried. So always, like I said, always critically look at your history because yeah. the, the only reason why you are reporting a bone scan is you are working on specificity because yes. the sensitivity is very high. Anything can show us increased uptake, degenerative process, infection, trauma, all right? So, but if you look at your history, you look at the pattern, you do additional images, then you'll be able to absolutely say whether this is degenerative process or this is malignant. But I yes. am very happy with your approach. The important thing again is the approach, all right? And I'm very happy with your approach. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. So I will uh, show the next, next patient, next, next scan. Again, this, this is a... Dr. Jawa, excuse me. Uh, I'm sorry, but there is a few, uh, some questions. I think uh, some people are asking about the activity in the right kidney. Yeah, and good. The, the non-visualization of the right uh, upper uh, uh, forearm and like this. So this is not complete scan or should we yeah, call exactly. it as a super so again, scan? Yeah. So this is, again, you see, like I said, you can have a lot of information regarding bone, uh, regarding renal function in patients who have had bone scan. If you look at it, this is a normal kidney, but look at this kidney. So from this, you will be able to say whether what is happening to this kidney. You can see that this is the pelvis. I didn't want to go into detail of discussing other soft tissue abnormalities, but with experience, you will know, even looking at this bone scan, you will know that this is a young, this is an elderly patient with probably a prostate CA, because you can see that there is, this is the pelvic cell system. There is obstructive there's obstruction in the pelvis. And that's why you can see that the kidney is abnormal in this circumstance. So good, it is always important to highlight this thing. So when you identify a whole body bone scan, again, sometimes you can say that this is cut off, you need an additional view. You can discuss that you need an additional imaging for the spine. But again, in the end of your presentation or your, your uh, presentation, you also discuss the possibility that there is an abnormal uh, left kidney. All right, so good that you raise it. Okay, can we move to the next one? Okay, uh, anyone else uh, for the okay. next case? So this is a 64 year old uh, male with a prostate cancer. Um, for, he was sent for a bone scan for staging. Yes, so anyone, any volunteer? Uh, Dr. Shreef Sopki. Okay. I thank you for the lecture, it's very useful. Pleasure. So yes, this, is, this is a whole bone scan for an adult patient. Beautiful. Um, I cannot see the kidney outline, okay. so it looks like a super scan to me. Right. Uh, with multiple areas of uptake, I can see um, increased uptake in the posterior vertebra in L4. There's also areas of focal uptake in the ribs bilaterally. Right. And also in the pelvic uh, rim, there's areas of uptake. So given that the patient has a history of prostate cancer, I'd be concerned that it's a uh, super scan secondary to prostate metastasis. Excellent. Thank you very much. This is a very brilliant. So, but the, I'm very happy with your description. You got everything correctly. But in this kind of thing, be careful to say focal. The description that you use is you said as they said, diffuse, increase uptake preferentially to the axial skeleton. You can mention that rib, spine, and other places, but it is diffuse, it is uniform. 
it is difficult to say that they have focal areas. Yeah, you can say there is a little bit, but these are the tip of the ribs, but it is diffuse. It is um, involving mostly the axial skeleton. The appendicular skeleton is preserved, all right? Sure, thank you. And the kidney is not safe. And then, so what differentiate this from a metabolic bone disease? Um, the history is probably indicative that they've had prostate cancer, so the from history the of prostate image, cancer. From, from the image, what is, what, is, what is against metabolic bone disease? Two important things against metabolic bone disease. Um, it's, folk, it's affecting mainly the skull, uh, sorry, the, um, the so vertebrae, without any effect in the spine, yeah, without it effect in the skull. Yeah. And then in metabolic bone disease, remember you have usually costochondral, uh, costochondral uptake, all right? Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Okay. Next one. So this is a um, forty-three-year-old female with a single nodule in the right part of the thyroid, and the, she has high level of hyperparathyroid hormone. I've given you the answer. Okay. Okay. Uh, Doctor Muhammad Durham. Hey, from. Assalamu uh, alaikum. Uh, this bone scan shows uh, multiple uh, rounded uh, hot spots uh, involving the costochondral junctions as well as the skull vault, uh, facial bones, and bony pelvis. Uh, this indicates that the kidney is spurred, and uh, I can visualize the kidney excretion and also the urine bladder. This is going with uh, metabolic bony disease, uh, hypertrophic. Uh, 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 primary, hyper, high primary hyperparathyroidism. Yes, hyperparathyroidism. Be beautiful. Again, good. Thank you very much. I like your approach. But again, one catch point here that you need to remember whole is body, that whole body scan. Yes. It is a whole body bone scan, but only in anterior projection. There yes. is no posterior projection. Okay. Okay. I All have right. one question, please, for yeah. the, the one case in the first. This rounded lesion in the rib. Uh, this one. In the first case, this okay. lung. Yes. Uh, there is this uh, rib lesion is rounded. And yes. you said to us that if it is oblong, it is metastatic. But if it is rounded, it is mostly a metabolic or fracture. Right. So yeah, correct. Uh, but this, this is usually single. You can look at it. It's a little bit elongated. It is not as focal. All right. Mm. And you will hardly get... Um, um, fracture to one single rib. Usually fractures are multiple and they are in the coastal region, but this is slightly elongated. So I will raise the suspicion and then with the addition of other similar lesions, I will raise the possibility um, of metastasis, all right? And also this of the femur, also it is, it is along, along this, yeah. this is going with stress fracture, right? No, no, it, the stress fracture is oval. Oval, and this is yes. oval. Yeah, this is no, this is long. You can see it is not oval. Oval is oval is like this. Let me mm. show you how oval looks. Oval is like this. And it's mainly cortical. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay, thank you. And then another thing is that stress fractures, if you're looking at stress fractures, please always look at the tibia because the commonest site for a stress fracture is at the tibia. You hardly, by the time you get stress fractures, in the femur, it has already affected. So you will see other similar lesions, okay? So these are things that, you will, that will help you to identify uh, or to make your diagnosis is by exclusion. Mostly stress fractures, are, majority of the stress fractures involve the tibia. Okay, thank you. Okay. Good, thank you very much. So Appreciate I'm very it. happy with this, uh, yeah. Okay, so next. This is history, is the history of a 58-year-old male patient who presented with severe, with severe pains in the um, left, in the right leg. Dr. Osama Brian. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum. How are you, doctor? Thank you for your nice presentation. Thank you very uh, much. Uh, I'm presented with a uh, bone scan, a uh, whole bone scan, anterior and serial view for an adult patient. Uh, there are uh, multiple areas of uh, hotspot at uh, proximal uh, right femur, right tibia, and uh, distal uh, left femur. There are also small area at the proximal uh, left tibia. Uh, the pelvic lesions also showing the area of 
increase uptake. There are also area of uptake at the proximal uh, right, uh, right scapula and uh, skull. Uh, right. mul uh, multiple uh, intersummary, uh, multiple uh, areas of uh, hot spots with expansion of the bone uh, involving the skull and uh, femur, tibia, and pelvis, uh, representing the polystatic uh, disease. Beautiful. Thank you very much. Only one point you miss. There is this, in addition to the expansion, there is intense uptake and deformity. Yes. Okay. So remember that Paget's disease, it is intense. There is expansion and deformity. All right. Yes. So, and remember that the additional information that you can give for this patient is the patient primarily present with pain only in the left leg, in the right leg. But you can see that he has a multifocal disease, all right? Yes. Okay, so beautiful. I'm very happy with your description and um, thank you thank very much. You. Thank thank you. You. Good, good. Thank you. Okay, so next patient. This patient is a 72 year old male patient who is um, diagnosed with prostate cancer and he has severe pains. He was sent to, for bone scan for staging. Okay, Dr. Talat, Good evening, uh, Dr. Jawa. Thank you for your uh, exquisite lecture. Hello? Yes, uh, we are here. It will, uh, we're here. Okay. Uh, is my voice clear? Right. Yes. Okay. Uh, anterior and posterior projections of uh, full uh, body bone scan. Uh, showing uh, intense diffuse uptake of the uh, of the skeleton with uh, preferential uptake for the uh, axial skeleton, right. including the ribs and the uh, pelvis, uh, with uh, no uh, clear visualization of uh, the uh, soft tissue, especially the renal tissue. This is indicative of uh, uh, a super scan, given the history that the patient has uh, the. Uh, <coughs> The history of uh, prostatic cancer. This is most likely uh, due to uh, metastatic uh, super scan, which is due to a diffuse uh, osteoblastic uh, metastasis, uh, prostatic metastasis. Beautiful, beautiful. I love your presentation. This is very nice. So, exactly, you got it. It's diffuse, it's intense, preferentially involving the axial skeleton. All right. But if you want to add additional, you can say, but again, there's additional focal uptake in the posterior aspect of the skull. All right. Oh, yeah. Uh, so this is consistent with a super scan. Um, you can see it again here on the posterior aspect. It's not seen on the anterior. On the anterior, you can see one focal one here, but on the posterior, you can see here. In the previous patient with a, um, remember the previous patient with a prostate cancer, the, the skull was preserved. It was only the axial skeleton. So please mm -hmm. always remember that. Again, once you, anytime you see uptake in the weight bearing areas, please lay a flag. You can just add at your report that this is, there is uptake in the, there is lesion in also involving the weight bearing areas. Uh, this is a site for pat the potential site for a patopolitical fracture. All right, but yes. I'm very happy with your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so this is a 64 year old male patient who is recently diagnosed with adenocarcinoma of the lung and he's been sent for a bone scan for staging of disease, exclude skeletal metastasis. Okay. Okay. Uh, go ahead, uh, Dr. Say. So I presented by uh, a whole body scan, a bone scan, uh, and you and the review. Uh, what I see is there is a, uh, uh, there is a specific uh, renal activity. I see increased activity along uh, uh, the uh, both lower limb, especially the cortical area in the linear pattern. Of the bus femur, uh, coincides with uh, this uh, uh, bruce reaction, yeah. uh, uh, and also seen in the, as the seen in the bus femur, and also in the bus uh, in the bone uh, lower uh, the femur, cortical uh, hyperactivity. And there is also perceived activity seen in the uh, uh, active seen in the bus kidney, so uh, and also the bone of the pelvis. Uh, so I present this is uh, mainly. Uh, 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 Barrel plastic reaction as the patient 
complaining for medical carcinoma of the lung. It connects us with this uh, for, uh, for the clinical data of the patient. So okay. the activity here I see in the pelvis mainly from uh, paraneoplastic activity of the patient complaining medical carcinoma. Okay, good. Uh, to so, see any metastatic okay, so beautiful. So is there a metastasis in this patient or not? The oncologist call you and say, is there metastasis or not? Because that will change the management of the patient. Is there a skeletal metastasis? Uh, I don't see a skeletal metastasis. I do only see only the, this uh, very high uh, reaction. So what, 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 do we call, what do we call this reaction? Hypertrophic it's pulmonary... Yeah, it's hyper, hypertrophic pulmonary osteoarthropathy, all right? So there is no evidence of skeletal metastasis in this patient. However, there is evidence of bilateral hyper osteo, uh, hypertrophic pulmonary osteoarthropathy. Okay. Beautiful. Beautiful. Okay, any question from this, please? Yeah, can I have a question? Yes, please. Uh, in this scan, Dr. Leo, should we ask for uh, static use for the yes. limbs because we cannot see the upper limbs yes. of uh, bilaterally? Beautiful. That is why I ask whether there is a question because if, if you are encountered with this scan, please always say that, look, I will need an additional static view. There will always be a static view. You will say, I need an additional static view of the lower limb. And then you will see clearly more lesions. If the examiner says, no, there is no, I don't have any additional view, then you can say that you have this linear uptake, you will need more additional view, but it looks more typical of, it's cortical, it's linear, it corresponds to future of pul hypertrophic pulmonary osteopathy. Thank you, Yasser. That is why I ask whether there is a question, because I want someone to highlight that. Uh, excuse me, Dr. John. Yes. Uh, in that patient on the posterior view, there are uh, some focal uptakes uh, in the uh, posterior ribs. Uh, should we consider this as metastatic or, uh, because they are in, where, in which patient? In this patient, same patient. Okay. In the yeah, there's, there's, lesion. there's lesion where? Uh, the rounded uh, uptake in the lower ribs. Uh, 10 and okay, 11 this, this, one, this one. Yes. Yeah, again, remember in elderly patients, you need to be careful. If you see this, this is all costochondral classic calcifications, all right? So you need to be careful. Again, you will ask for more views. Anytime you look at a whole body bone scan and you see lesions that you are not very sure of, please ask for an additional view. But with experience and with age and with patient, this usually these patients will come with us to us with x-rays. They will have they will have done chest x-rays. So you can raise the suspicion, but it doesn't look typical of what we see um, in patients with skeletal metastasis. But I agree with you, yes, it's good to critically look at the bone scan but remember that not everything you see in a bone scan is optic another example i'll give you here is you see you see a single lesion here around the around the face what do you think this is dental maybe yeah existential but why are we seeing it more is because this patient is slightly rotated all right that's why this place is more prominent than the other side so again these are things that you need to be very careful about if you say you are going to look at any lesion and call them disease uh, then you will call every uptake as a metastasis. But it is important to critically look at it, to have a pattern of explanation. And sometimes you can raise those flags, but uh, oftentimes, you know, like with experience and with time, you will then be able to know that, yeah, in some elderly patients, particularly, you get irregular uptakes um, that are not so typical of um, skeletal mess. And especially if you don't see any other lesion. And especially if this is a type of cancer that has a preferential um, axial, axial involvement, like lung cancer, you know, we said most patients with lung cancer will have preferential appendicular skeleton. Another information that I need to give on this slide is please, if this is a history of a patient with a lung cancer, the first thing you should do is say that you need additional view because lung cancer spreads to the appendicular skeleton. And you can see that this is not a complete whole body. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Okay. Um, can, I, can I ask one more question, Dr. Yes, yes. In the, in the first patient, the first case, uh, there was one of the vertebrae had no uptake. Uh, uh, you want me to go back to another patient or this one? The first patient. First yes, patient? Number one, yes. Okay. Let's see here, there is a vertebrae, uh, I think uh, number three, maybe or L3 or L2, has reduced uptake. This one? No, up more high. 
between between both to piece. Yes, this one. Good, beautiful. Any, any significance? Okay, so yeah, you can also mention this, but then again, one of the things you need to do is you say that you need, I know about these cases because I have additional views and spec CT. Anytime you see irregular uptake involving the spine, please ask for a spec CT. So if you are given, if you are encountered with a picture like this on your examination, you describe all these lesions. You can see there's another one again here. So, but if you keep asking for, if you keep ask, if you keep um, saying that all these are lesions, it means you will say that. But the important thing is that you ask for an additional spec CT. The spec CT will clearly uh, differentiate to you um, the various pathological process. Again, I agree with you, and this is very good that you were able to, to see those lesions. Good. Any other questions? Okay, so, uh, okay. Uh, Dr. Yeah. Zaba? Yes. No, thank you for the uh, nice presentation. Actually, we are not uh, well exposed to nuclear medicine, so it was a very uh, good experience right. with you. Uh, I'd like to ask you about the uh, aesthetic views. Right. Does having multiple aesthetic views uh, have uh, anything to do with increased radiation exposure? Good question. Remember, I told you that the importance, the, the advantage of nuclear medicine is that with a single injection, you are imaging the entire patient. So the, the, the idea of doing a static view or any additional view does not expose the patient to radiation. The only thing is time. So in nuclear medicine, we are more concerned about time than radiation. If a patient has a pain in the finger and a patient with metastasis, they will all receive the same dose. But if you need additional images, you are not exposing the patient. Remember, our machine does not, ex does not expose patients to radiation. You have already injected that patient yeah. with radiation, all right? All right, so just the, another question. So the important thing is time. In, in diagnostic radiology, if you ask for an additional view, you are exposing the patient to radiation. In nuclear medicine, if you ask for additional view, the technologies will be crazy at you because you are wasting time. <laughs> I got time, it. Yeah, so time is critical. So the same dose you do, you can do with a single dose, you can do your three phase bone scan, you can do your whole body, you can do statics, you can do spec CT, you can do everything with a single dose, even if the patient's problem is in the finger, it's the same dose that the patient gets. But what you are wasting is that you are wasting time. Very okay. good. Yeah. Uh, just another question regarding a suspected, uh, suspected scaphoid fracture with negative wrist radiograph. Yeah. Uh, if both um, bone scan and MRI are available, which right. one is uh, to go with? Well, it depends on the, uh, for scaphoid fracture, well, for these days, to be honest with you, MRI has a better resolution um, and it's readily available. But in patients who cannot do MRI, you can do a spec CT. The, all, the ad additional advantage that you will get with a bone scan is that you will be able to see the viability of the bone, whether the scaphoid bone is completely necrosed or not. So that is the additional information that you will get. But um, these days we hardly get indication for a scaphoid fracture. Um, MRI usually it's, it's a better um, imaging modality. Okay, just the last question. Uh, how would you differentiate between uh, flare phenomena from uh, disease progression? Are you going to rely on the next follow-up to write in your report that this is a state of disease progression or a flare phenomena? Beautiful. So you will, it, you, it depending on the clinical circumstance of the patient. Remember I told you, patient with flare phenomenon, there is flaring of the lesions. And what compounds the problem is that the patient has more symptoms of pain and discomfort because those lesions have increased vascular supply and they have increased osteoblastic activity. So the pain will increase, the lesion will get flared. So in this kind of circumstance, a decision has to be taken, you know, whether to do an additional image. So one of the things you can do is to follow up the patient after three months to see the patient will be on painkillers and everything and follow the patient or to do a, spect, a PET CT. Okay. A PET CT is the positron emission computer tomography, which rely on FDG glucose uptake. So that will tell you whether there is viable tissue or it is just a flare phenomenon. Uh, Dr. Raja, regarding uh, the PET CT, I have a small question. So um, within, uh, in bone scan, uh, there is uh, there in, in osteoblastic um, 
lesions, there is increased uptake or uh, hot, and uh, it's it's a cold uh, whenever there is uh, osteolytic uh, lesion. Okay. But uh, I, I, but uh, that's not the that's not the case with the uh, PET CT, right? Because right. in PET CT, the osteolytic lesion tends to have uh, more um, more uh, metabolically being more metabolically active than uh, uh, sclerotic one. Is that is that right? Yeah, because remember that osteolytic lesions sometimes, depending on their nature, can displace the bony architecture of the region. So you, they can also apply it as a reduced glucose uptake. But there are certain osteolytic lesions which will show intense glucose uptake, which is more than what you see on the mm -hmm. bone scan. All right? All right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So this, uh, this patient is a 63-year-old male who, again, who is recently diagnosed uh, with squamous cell carcinoma of the lung, and he's sent for a bone scan for staging. Uh, yes. So uh, anyone? Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, Osama Brahim, uh, do you want to come again? Okay. 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 Doctor, I'm presented with. Uh, okay. I'm presented with uh, uh, whole bone scan, anterior and posterior static view, uh, for patient uh, known uh, squamous cell lung. There are uh, increased uptake of the left upper uh, lobe of the lung, representing the squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, there are another focal uh, uptake at the uh, left rib posterior aspect, upper uh, left second or third rib posterior aspect. Uh, uh, repre yes, representing uh, maybe due to, uh, maybe apart from the tumors or uh, rib lesion. Uh, the, the kidneys appear to have high tracer uptake. And yes. There, yes, most kidneys and the urinary bladder also shows the tracer. Uh, okay. Uh, there are uh, no definite uh, lesions uh, detected at the particular skeleton, uh, and the skull uh, showing also no uh, definite uptake. Okay. Uh, uh, in summary, uh, there are uh, focal uptake of the uh, primary tumors in the lung, and uh, possible suspected bone lesions in the uh, ribs in the posterior aspect left side. Uh, you need uh, further static views for uh, this area to confirm the uh, presence of the static lesion. Beautiful, beautiful. So I'm very happy with your presentation. So this is good. You can see that there is an increased uptake around this area. This represents the primary lesion, all right? Yes. Okay, so they, uh, but there's no any, this is again the same thing. So it's anterior, you are seeing this, and this is the same. This is called a shine true. It's a phenomenon called shine true when you have a sub, uh, an, an intense uptake in the anterior that you see it on the posterior, all right? Okay. So it's a reflection of this image that you are seeing on this. So this is a phenomenon called a shine true phenomenon, all right? Yes. So this is, this is, so this is not a secondary lesion, it's the same lesion that you are seeing. I'm very happy that you noted the kidney. So you can see that this kidney has intense uptake. It means that there's obstruction. And if you look at it, there's irregular. The cortex is a bit irregular. So it's probably some obstructive uropathy. Another question you need to answer. But mm -hmm. one of the things I want to highlight here is that if you look at the spine, you can mm -hmm. visualize the entire spine. But when it comes to the upper part, you can't see the spine. Can you see? No. Here. Yeah. There are differences. Right? You, can, you can see the entire spine, but at this level, you are not properly seeing the other spine. So what has happened here is that this patient, usually if they have some form of therapy, radiotherapy, sometimes you have patients who would present would reduce uptake following um, radiotherapy. So this patient had had some radiotherapy to his primary lesion. That's why you are not properly visualizing the upper part of the spine. But I'm okay. very happy that you identified those um, lesions. Beautiful. Okay. Thank you, Doctor. This okay. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, according to the, osteo, the osteoporotic phase of the Paget's disease, right, uh, as the osteoporotic circumscript of the skull, right, uh, the bone scan appearance of these, it take a bone scan to take tracers or appearing uh, a cold spot or like this. It will appear the circumscript will appear intense uptake, but with a central area of lucency. 
All right. So you will see intense uptake with expansion uh, and some form of deformity, but the central area will look photopenic. Okay, even if it is a stiburotic case. Yes, even if it is, yes. Thank you. All right, good. Okay, so I think I will. Uh, Okay, so in uh, these are all things that we have discussed. I don't want to go again into detail. There are too many of them. I will just show you this last image. This last image just desc describe a, a whole body bone scan in a patient, in an adult patient. You can see intense uptake. All right, what do you think this uptake is? Is soft tissue? Anyone wants to volunteer? Sarcoma, Intense soft tissue uptake. It's not in the bone, it's in the soft tissue. Maybe cellulitis. Sorry? It is a root sarcoma region or bilateral. Okay, and sometimes it could just be due to, due to calcifications, all right? Soft tissue calcification. This patient had severe trauma. All right, and he had a lot of calcification. So again, in these circumstances, without a history, without an X-ray, without a, pl a pl plain graph and everything, it is very difficult. This is a situation where, like, why I'm showing you this is that bone scan is very sensitive, but you need additional information. And please don't be afraid to ask for additional view. Don't be afraid to ask uh, for other modalities. If you are not certain clear, you can say, please, I would want to see the X-ray or the radiograph if it's available of this patient. And immediately you will see in this patient, it was a heavy calcification, okay? So in summary, uh, I would like to end by saying that a bone scan is a nuclear medicine imaging technique that provides us with information on bone physiology and metabolism, like I said. The advantage of a bone scan to answer your question is that it provides you with a single injection Within a short time, you will get the whole body of the patient. It is extremely sensitive, but we suffer from specificity. This is what, because, because anything that increases blood, uh, bone turnover will show as increased uptake. So what is important is that whenever you are encountered with a bone scan, please have the confidence. As long as you can be able to identify the bone scan, you are able to say whether this is what type of view, either it's a whole body view, a static view, a spec CT, or a tomographic view, or a three-phase bone scan, then it will lead you to the pattern of the disease and then you will be able to identify um, most of the disease and pathological process. You'll be able to differentiate metastasis, trauma, degenerative disease, uh, metabolic uh, bone diseases highly. But always remember that your bone scan is extremely sensitive, um, but it suffers from low specificity. You are all very, very wonderful audience and really I thank you very, very much. Uh, we would like to thank you very much, uh, Professor Jawa, for this uh, very nice, excellent lecture. And uh, of course, uh, we would be welcoming you to uh, many more um, uh, lectures in the coming uh, days, inshallah. Inshallah. Uh, and uh, thank you for uh, all the attendees and participants. Um, thank you all, and thank you, uh, Professor Jawa. Uh, see you. See you again. Thank you very much. It was a nice uh, discussion with you. I enjoyed this audience. They uh, are very intelligent. Nice. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye bye.